Hi, Wendy. Hello, Listen, Helen. Thanks for doing this interview about bees today. Um, this is inspiring Northeast TV, and hopefully, these interviews just might inspire somebody. So, tell me about your bees. And okay, so so when we talk about bees, we're going to talk about honey bees because there are there's a, um, there's a few hundred other types of bee that. Um, live in the UK but we'll just talk about honeybees because um, that's what most people think about. So um, I've got two colonies of bees and I'm a, very much a novice beekeeper. Um, as I did the course, there was a beekeeping course um, that you could do in Northumberland uh, in 2019 but I felt a bit nervous about getting bees then, I didn't really feel ready for it. So I did some um, uh, beginner sessions with the Hexham Beekeeping Association because one of the things that's quite important about um, looking after bees is that when you say to people oh I, I've got bees they go oh bees and then they go oh bees mm. um, because there's a certain amount of anxiety and I had some anxiety about bees I'd never been stung by a honeybee I'd been stung by wasps and a bumblebee but never been stung by a honeybee um, so my, my first experience of, of actually inspecting a hive, I was sort of a bit nervous about how it would go. It was a fantastically hot day. And because um, you have to wear all the gear and you could just feel the sweat running off you. Um, and the guy that was doing it with me just kept saying, are you okay? Are you okay? And I went, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Because I was just fascinated. It was really fascinating to take the lid off this hive and see, um, well, they say that sort of hives in summer might have 50,000 bees in them. Now, a lot of those bees aren't gonna be actually in the hive during the day because they're gonna be out foraging. Um, but, you know, there might be half that amount and you're actually looking at them all. Uh, and then you're inspecting them all. So you're taking out these, um, I call them frames that sit inside the hive and you lift them out and you have to look really closely at them to look to make sure everything's okay, to check that they've got enough food, to see if you can find the queen um, and make sure that the queen is laying eggs and that there's no problems there. Um, so I got my bees, uh, my first uh, hive, I got purely by accident last year because with it being um, a lockdown year, Hex and beekeepers weren't selling hives to novices because of normally they would mentor you and they didn't really feel that they could come and um, and join you because you have to get quite close and they felt it wasn't COVID safe. So I just well, I didn't want to get bees from somewhere else. I wanted to get local bees. And I think that's quite important um, that you try and keep your bees from where your locality is. It's a better way of trying to avoid spreading diseases and you tend to have bees that are more adapted to your area and living in sort of the South Tyne Valley, North Pennines, it can be a bit bleak here. So I wanted to get um, uh, bees that knew how to cope with the cold and the wet. So I didn't think anything of it until um, I volunteered to help someone move their bees. They had five hives and they wanted to move them from a village near here into Hexham. And I volunteered to help the guy. And he said, oh, by the way, would you like a hive? Because he was downsizing. And I said, well, I haven't got any bees. And he said, well, do you want to start? So I said, OK. So then there was a mad panic on to get everything ready for them and where they were going to go. Because I didn't really want them in the garden. Because everywhere that I suggested they go just seemed like not a good place. You know, oh, no, I'll get in the way of the car. No, that'll get in the way of the washing. No, I like to sit there and blah, blah, blah. So I managed to get um, uh, the local landowner to let me use a patch of land outside of the garden. Um, just I can see the bees from the garden, but they're on the other side of the of a, of a burn. Uh, in a really beautiful spot, actually, I'd like... I'd like to live in that little hive with surrounded by bluebells in the spring and then there's bracken and the trees protecting them and everything. It's really pretty. So um, I managed to sort of get everything set up, got a stand, a friend who keeps bees 
built a stand with me and, and everything and we we're all ready to go so we got first set of, of um, bees and my first colony and then I was just terrified I was thinking, oh god I've got to do it on my own I'd never opened up a bird uh, a beehive on my own always had done it with someone else and that first time because normally when you're new to beekeeping you get something called a nucleus which is a easily half the size of a of a full bee colony but this was a massive colony so it was a hive and then it had something called it was actually a brood and a half normally you would have a brood box but this had a, another half box on top of it so that was another kind of 50 percent more and then on top of that there are things called supers and supers is where the honey is made because you stop the queen going up into the supers because the queen will lay eggs wherever she can. Mm -hmm. And you, if, you're, if you want honey, you don't want larvae and eggs in your honey. I mean, it's not good for the bees because yeah. they're going to be destroyed, but it's also not very good for your honey. Mm -hmm. um, so it, this came with two supers on top with honey in it. It was like it was a massive thing. It was really heavy and it was like oh my god and that first time I opened them up um, and I did it with my partner who'd never looked inside a hive before and these bees were really raggy and normally bees don't get they're not too cross you know you look you just do everything gently and I've never had an experience where I was surrounded by bees that just wanted to sting you and that's what, how they behaved. And I, I just said, well, stop. We're just putting everything back. We're just going to leave them. And I spoke to the guy who'd given me the bees and he said, oh, maybe they've lost their queen because they thought, he thought that they had probably swarmed. Um, and if they were queenless, then that makes them really angry. And also potentially you'd lose your colony. So I left it for about 10 days and then I steeled myself to have another look. I was quite nervous and they were lovely. And I found the queen and the queen was laying eggs and I think she's a new queen. So I think that was probably the problem. Yeah. I had a new queen that hadn't probably started laying eggs and the workers were a bit grumpy. Yeah. So now I've got a second colony because I bought, because they always say you can't manage with one colony because if you have a problem, then you need a second colony to help you rectify it. Um, so I bought a second. The, rest, the first one was given to me free, which yeah. is fantastic. And then I bought um, the second one, which is a, a quite a much smaller colony, um, but very benign bees. And I got them from a, from uh, someone who runs the apiary um, for the Hex and Beekeeping Association. So they came with a good pedigree. Um, so at the moment, they're tucked up in their hives and hopefully... Um, Wow. okay they're, they're doing what's called they're in a cluster at the moment so the, the bees form a we always talk about a kind of rugby ball shaped um, uh, colony um because that's the natural kind of form they make so they'll be clustered together the queen will be somewhere in the middle and they will be the workers there'll be no male bees the drones have all been kicked out um, so it's just the female workers and the queen and they will be looking after each other, keeping themselves warm. So even though it might be below freezing, they should be sort of 24 degrees, something like that, low 20s, um, uh, so that they can survive the winter and it, hopefully eating food. They'll have their own honey stores, but just to be on the safe side, I gave them some extra food um, at the beginning of what, what, this year what well at this time of year you give them something called fondant which is very similar to um sort of um icing fondant that you could buy mm -hmm. down the supermarket this is slightly different because it doesn't have any additives in it but um it doesn't freeze so it's uh, it's they're able to access it whatever the temperature in the summer in the spring and in the summer and autumn, if you need to give them any um, food, you give them a strong sugar syrup. Um, and people say, well, that's cheating, isn't it? But actually, you, you know, it's better to have a live colony of bees than bees that have died through starvation. Mm. So if you have times when there's not much forage for them or the weather's been very bad or it's a, 
it's a, a new colony which doesn't have very much in the way of stores, then um, you, you, you do sometimes have to give them supplementary um, food. Well, how much time and work is it on your part? How, what's, what's the upkeep, you know? What... Yeah, well, over the winter, nothing really, uh, apart from sort of um, maybe doing a bit of prep um, or making sure that you're, you've got all the equipment that you need. But, you know, nothing really. You might build some frames ready for the season. Um, here, the season is relatively short. Um, so you'd probably do your first inspection around um, April time, depending on the weather. Um, and you probably do your last one in October, depending on the, your weather. The, the, the general rule about um, honeybees is that they are at their most active on the longest day of the year. So they're building up to June the 21st. Yeah. Um, and then they're, and that's when the colony will be potentially its biggest. And then they're slowly kind of reducing activity um, until they, they don't hibernate, but until they just um, form the cluster and sort of bed down for the winter. They will come out in the winter. If it's a warm day, a warm winter's day, they'll come out, um, uh, they'll come out, they'll get rid of any dead bees because they want to keep the place clean and keep diseases down. So they'll get rid of dead bees and they'll also come out for a poo. So I have this image of them all hanging on in there, you know, desperately <laughs> thinking, oh, I need to get outside. Or, oh, I can't, it's too wet or it's too cold or whatever. Um, so that's one of the things they warn you about when you keep bees. If you're uh, if you've got neighbours and the 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 washing line is under the flight path, <laughs> your clothes can get a bit splattered with oh. little dots of bee poo. <laughs> I haven't experienced that yet. So so do you need flowers in the vicinity then? Do you need some? Uh, you do. Um, they will. I mean. They will obviously come into the, the garden um, if you've got flowers in the garden. And, you know, last summer we'd be wandering around going, oh, there's one. I wonder if that's one of ours. But I mean, there's other beehives around here. Um, they can fly up to three miles away from the hive. So they can fly quite a long distance. And they're, they're very dependent on, um, on a mixture uh, honeybees are very good in that they will they will pollinate all sorts of different flowers they're not limited to one particular flower and that will change as to what's in in um in bloom and they they're very keen on tree blossom so um you know we had hawthorn or um bird cherry or um we've got lime trees on the other side of the river and if they're in flower they would really love that um, and if you're near Heather, um, I think they can probably reach Heather here. We're, we're close enough. Um, so the, uh, a mixture. And it's uh, quite interesting when, uh, when they're fascinating to watch because if you, you can just sit outside the hive, they're not, as long as you're not um, doing anything to them, they won't be trying to attack you. Um, um, and you can watch them coming and going. And it's interesting to see the color of pollen that they bring in, because um, that will help you identify what, what they're actually feeding off. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it's yellow, sometimes it's green, sometimes it's purple, sometimes it's white. It's all sorts of different colors. That's quite nice I to see. You can see it. You'd expect it to be like really tiny. Well, uh, what they do is they get covered in, in the pollen on their sort of, you know, um, on their bodies and then they clean that down onto little sort of uh, little kind of combs of hairs on their legs. And you, you'll see that you'll see honeybee, um, you'll see bumblebees and the little um, there'll be little balls of um, packets of pollen um, all neatly packaged up, stuck to their legs. Um, and the pollen is important because that contains protein. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, a hive, a successful bee colony, whether it's honeybees or solitary bees or bumblebees, they need a mixture of nectar 
give the carbohydrates, give them energy, but they also need protein, um, particularly if they're producing um, eggs and larvae and, and new bees. And what about harvesting? How do you know what and when? Yeah, I, I, so they, they always say you never get any honey the first year that you keep bees, but because I was given a, um, a well-established colony, which came or did come with some honey, um, I did take um, some frames off um, and I got four jars of honey and some honeycomb, which I was very excited about. It took me absolutely ages to extract the honey because I don't have an extractor. Um, uh, but you have to just make sure that you leave enough honey behind for them. Um, and I did give them some supplementary food, some syrup in the autumn, just to be on the safe side, which one colony didn't take at all. And the other colony just wolfed it down. So I don't know what that meant. Um, so it, you can take honey, but you just can't take too much because if you if you leave them without any stores, they won't survive the winter. Um, and it's you know I don't think people keep bees not at first anyway for the honey. I mean, the honey's a nice sort of extra, um, but I mean I've met beekeepers who haven't who've had bees for a couple of years and they've never had any honey off them. It's very dependent on on the season that you have and the strength of your colony um and where yeah where you're located so if you're it, it here we don't have any oilseed rape um but if you're in the Tyne valley you would have access to you know fields of oilseed rape and that the, the bees love that and produce a lot of honey or you'd move them up into the moors in august for the heather honey um, what you would actually take the hive up yeah you would physically move the hive so you know when when we did this um mo moving last summer when i moved the hives with this guy i didn't know how you would do it um i just turned up in my bee suit and he had gone the night before and uh, in the uh, at night all the bees are going to be inside they're not going to be anywhere else. So then you just tape everything up. So you tape the entrance and you tape tape all the the bits together so that you can't accidentally shift them and you tie the whole thing up. And then you can put them in a vehicle and drive them. So you, you would do that, you would do it the night before and then you would move them the following morning and then you'd open up and then you would run away because they, they're a bit, they don't like being moved. They've been a bit grumpy. And I did, I have been stung now by my bees. I had a bit of a, an incident where I was a bit cocky and I did something to them that I thought I could do fairly quickly and I wouldn't disturb them. And it was basically just giving them some food. Mm -hmm. And so I took the lid off and um, I had to open up a little, um, uh, a, a little sort of opening on the top um, top board and I thought I'll do that really quickly and then I'll just put the um, put the feeder on top and then I won't have released any bees mm -hmm. and um, I just was a bit cack handed and I just didn't get it done quickly enough and some of the bees came out and just went straight for me I had to run away if anyone had seen me it would have been very funny so <laughs> running away having been stunned twice I waited for a bit and then snuck back and quickly put the lid back on. Did it hurt? It did actually. Yeah, it did. Uh, it it hurt and then it sort of remained itchy. I had two stings and they remained itchy for a long time, but I didn't swell up like a balloon, mm -hmm. which is always the worry because even beekeepers sometimes, even though they've been a beekeeper for years, can sometimes develop the um, allergies to the stings and get anaphylaxis and have to give up beekeeping it's very sad right so i'm just thinking about young people it sounds quite expensive i suppose with the yeah. hand training yeah. and the outfit is there any other way i suppose to reduce costs i suppose it's who you know isn't it yes i think so i mean i think the the, the way to to know if you want to get interested in bees is to um 
go with a beekeeper um, uh, or join a beekeeping association that has beginner sessions because uh, beekeepers are always really, really keen to share their enthusiasm um, and the fascination that there is for, for bees. So you can do that for next to nothing because um, everyone will have a spare suit. You know, the, the Hexham beekeepers have loads and loads of suits. So I, I just, you could just borrow theirs and you just have to take a pair of wellies really and your own gloves. Um, if you actually wanted to get into it, I think it, it is expensive to, to get yourself set up. I would imagine that you can buy a lot of equipment secondhand mm -hmm. um, because people do it and then don't want to do it, you know. Uh, they, they, I've got a friend who lives up the road and she did it for a couple of years, but she's given it up because she can keep her bee colony going. Um, I think once you're set up, then um, you can you can manage without actually buying that much, much stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the initial outlay, I mean, I I bought a new hive that was flat packed so I had to build it but that was over 200 quid mm. um mm. and then you would normally pay about 180 pounds for um uh, a colony yeah. a, a queen with a colony of, of um, worker bees um if somebody wanted to set up a little industry it seems like there's a lot of outlay and not much profit to begin with certainly I mean how how do people earn a living you know because you do have yeah i think the people that earn a living from from bees are pretty massive outfits you know they have a lot of hives and and honey is very expensive you know british honey five pounds a jar yeah. um so if you've got enough hives and you can generate um um a lot of jars of honey then you you can make a bit of money but it's it's a little bit precarious um, but, you know, there's a Northumberland Honey Company here in Haltwhistle mm -hmm. um, who've set themselves up. Um, and I don't know how many hives they, they've got. I think they've got some hives near me. Um, um, and they've got them dotted all over the place. Um, but you think with the sort of go local um, movement and buying locally that it yeah. could be, you know, could be... A something that more people would want in the future. Yes, well, I think honey is, uh, not everyone likes honey, do they? It's a bit sort of Marmite for some people. Um, um, and there, there is an argument that we shouldn't, I mean, there's a counter argument about keeping bees because it always used to be, oh, let's keep bees because bees are dying out and mm -hmm. and it's good for the it's good for our wildlife and blah blah blah. I mean, I, it, there is an argument that it's not good for the countryside to keep bees mm -hmm. because what what you're doing is you're introducing um, a whole load of other pollinators that are just going to compete with all the other. Um, bumblebees and solitary bees and all the other things that feed on nectar and pollen and will compete with them and as we all know the countryside is becoming less and less full of wildflowers mm. um, I suppose I would counter the argument that if you keep if you're on a small scale keeping bees then you are going to the way you garden if you're lucky enough to have a garden um is is it's very pollinator friendly i don't this is an organic garden and um we grow loads of flowers primarily because we like them but also we choose the flowers that we know the pollinators like so we don't go for the big showy flowers um, and we try to have things in flower uh, for as long as possible through the season um, so I think it does influence the way you do that but you know some people will keep uh, urban bees are doing really well yeah. uh, interestingly urban bees seem to be doing better than um, bees in the countryside now because the countryside is just well our, the way we've farmed and the insecticides we use and all the rest of it 
squares um, going to the cities and, and the gardens and allotments and people do have a lot of flowers. Um, so keeping bees on your balcony or on your roof in a, in a city is um, not a bad idea. Very good. I know you've had a career in medicine, but you've always had a passion for nature, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Yeah. So what's, what's really important to you about nature? What, what is it that motivates you to go out and do all the things you do and volunteering? And... Um, yeah, it's difficult to give a sort of simple answer to that. I suppose I've, found, I've always found it fascinating and it's something that is on your doorstep if you are prepared to look for it. Um, and it's always changing. So whenever I go out for a walk, I'll always be looking out for flowers or animals or um, butterflies or birds. I, I, just, I just find it fascinating um, and, and something that's quite precious. And I feel sad that um, it's disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't see, see starling murmurations in the centre of Newcastle anymore, which we used to see, you know. Um, so if I can do a little bit to help, mm -hmm. um, then that makes me feel that I'm doing something valuable. And if I can go out with friends and say, oh, look at that, and then I can tell them a little bit about it, they're sort of like, oh, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Yes, yeah. you're spreading your passion. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> That's great. Some people, I think, just go, oh, God, she's off again. <laughs> or I stop. It really, you know, I'll go out for a walk and then I'll just suddenly stop to look at something. It's like will you just catch up and get on with this walk? And so sometimes it can be a bit tricky um, trying to combine that if you've got to, you know, get a particular walk done in a certain amount of time. Because there's a lot of people who want to do something to help save the planet, but really, you know, probably think about it, but sometimes don't do the things that they might do. I mean, I don't know. Well, I think sometimes it just feels a bit overwhelming, mm -hmm. you know, and what what can I do? And I, I think we can all do something really small. And if we all do something small, then that becomes something much larger. Mm -hmm. So saying that, oh, there's no point, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's well, this this year. It was really nice, actually, the, the, this year uh, or this um, winter, um, autumn, winter, was um, huge amounts of acorns, huge amounts. It was called a mast year, mm -hmm. uh, 2020. So I don't know if you've been out in walking woods, you were treading on acorns. They were sort of carpeting the woods. And um, we went out for a walk and they were all starting to sprout. Um, so uh, we filled a carrier bag. Mm -hmm. um, and then because I volunteer with the National Trust, um, at Allen Banks, we just took the carrier bag and planted them all. Oh, fabulous. I don't know how many of them will do, um, but you know, it was worth a pop, and they were just going to be trampled on on footpaths and things. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I counted them. There was a few, good few hundred, and and then and I also picked a load of um, little older saplings that had germinated in a car park well they weren't going to do they were just going to get sprayed off it was in a campsite car park yeah. growing up through the gravel so I, I picked a few hundred of those and we planted those as well mm -hmm. I mean that's it's a little thing and it was half a day to do with that's some the friends volunteering, the volunteering opportunity and the classes that you joined that's I guess that's a good start isn't it for people Yes, yeah, and you get to meet people who then introduce you to other people and you find out about, you know, things going on. Um, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good way in if you're interested in that sort of thing. And if you're interested, and the nice thing about that sort of volunteering is that you're outside. Oh, fantastic, yeah. Lovely. You know, and at the moment, it's not going, it's not happening at the moment, but it will do again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic. 
anything else what next or you know what, what next yeah. uh, well this this year is the big year for me as oh. beekeeper because this is year where i have to work out what to do to stop my bees from swarming oh. And that's a little bit complicated. Um, so I'll be sort of getting help from other people for advice. And I have, I have, it is harder to start off keeping bees, just checking them on your own because I haven't been able to have some, anyone else come to help me. Yeah. Um, so, sorry. Responsibility. It is a responsibility. I know there's all these lives, you know, their, their lives are in my hands. Um, so if, without doing anything, the, the, the bees will probably swarm because that's what bees do, honeybees. They, get, they want to get bigger and bigger. The colony gets bigger. And then the queen decides that there isn't enough space. Um, I'm going to go and find a hole in a tree somewhere yeah. or I'm going to go down someone's chimney or into their loft or whatever yeah. and form another colony. So she'll leave take half the bees with her and the bees that are left behind will make a new queen and that's fine but you've lost you know 25,000 bees um, and um, you've got a brand new queen that you hope is going to be okay um, and your colony is sort of somewhat decimated and has to start over again so the general rule is to try and avoid that if you can so that that's going to be so the first task is to get them through the winter. Yeah. And then the second task is to um, try and stop them swarming. So will you need another hive then? Yeah, so what, what, you, um, what you do is you have something called a nucleus, which is a small hive. And then you basically, if you think your colony is about to swarm, you split them. Yeah. So you take the, the queen and she'll, she'll come with, um, a few thousand of her worker bees and put, put, put a frame on with the, the queen on and put small frames in. That forms a, a, a small colony on its own and then the colony that's lost its queen will make a new queen. Oh, that's amazing. I've got to... I make it sound very simple. It's I know I've got a little bit more complicated than that. You in a beekeeper outfit surrounded by 25,000 bees. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it probably will happen. <laughs> you won't be able to see me for a cloud of bees. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we'll see. And also, you just don't know what the season's going to be like. It could be terrible, right. you know, or it could be fantastic. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's excellent. Thank you very much for sharing that insight. And hmm. anything else? Anything else you want to add that I haven't that we haven't explored? No, we could we could talk for hours about bees. They're very very complicated, and the the whole process of beekeeping is a mind boggling boggling. And I think you need to be doing it for many many years to know what you're doing and recognizing what's going on in the hive so i'm a complete novice really so um fingers crossed you know it all goes well that you can ask and... yeah 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 that's that's good okay russia we leave it there that's good. okay so thank you very much thanks wendy that's great see you again bye-bye okay bye Helen. <laughs>